I'm now delighted to uh, call up to the stage our third and final guest, François-Philippe Champagne, who is the Minister of International Trade, um, who has uh, probably got more aeroplane miles than uh, any of us. Good morning. Good morning. What a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Merci. On l'apprécie énormément. Yeah, first show on trade. Oh, and, and you're a part of it. The way is that people are always right. I look at the poll and, yeah. and I They're think They're always right if the polls wisdom. go your way. Well, listen, you know, <laughs> I saw a lot of wisdom this morning in the polls. But it, it's, it's very nice to be with all of you this morning. Talking about trade and, and the impact of trade on our people. And, and so delighted, honestly, that you chose that because... Uh, this is really having an impact on all Canadians, and not just Canadians, but people around the world. So happy to share some thoughts with you. Do you have a crystal ball that lets you predict what's going to happen in the NAFTA negotiations at the end of the month? Geez, I wish. Uh, but, but one thing I can say, and I think people have seen it, and other panelists have uh, mentioned that. We knew it would be difficult. Uh, we knew it would be complex. Uh, but I think what Canadians expect of us, Catherine, is to be constructive, to be solution-oriented, to be at the table, uh, but also to stand firm. You may have seen me this week and say, you know, sometime uh, it's good to send a strong message, a message of firmness and say, we talk about the forest industry, we talked when there was this discussion about unfair duties on Bombardier. We stood firm and we sent a strong signal. So no crystal ball, but a resolve to make it work. Uh, we remind our friends uh, south of the border that this is an agreement that has provided prosperity to, to our people. Millions of jobs, middle class jobs, depend on, on, on that agreement. Uh, I often put numbers, you know, this is two billion of goods and services exchanged every day. This is 400,000 people uh, crossing the border. And Canada uh, is the largest client of the United States, bigger than China, Japan, and the UK combined. Uh, so oftentimes when you put that in perspective and you saw Team Canada playing, making sure that we engage not only with the White House, uh, but with governors, with mayor, with business people. You know, when you have the president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce agreeing with the Canadian position, I think that it says a lot about, uh, you know, our position and our constructive nature at this table. You, one of the countries you were in most recently was China. Yeah. Uh, you got left behind in Beijing to... For to, good to, reasons. For a good reason, for a good reason, but to continue... Uh, with further conversations there. Can I ask you if you think that the progressive element of the government's trade, trade uh, agenda is in fact impacting the ability to have discussions with certain countries like China? Well, first of all, I'm happy you mentioned uh, that because uh, this was a topic uh, discussed before. Uh, with respect to China, listen, uh, we've been clear to Canadians and to our friends, uh, this was not about next Friday. Uh, this is about the next few decades. I mean, this is a partner, with, we exchange 85 billion of bilateral trade, uh, uh, you know, becoming the largest economy of the world. And it's part of our diversification strategy. I think some panelists mentioned that, you know, you need to diversify and clearly uh, things are shifting in Asia. So this is part of our broad-based strategy. I would say quite the opposite, you know, our progressive trade agenda. And what is progressive trade agenda? It's all about making sure that trade works for people. Trade is about people. Uh, you cannot do trade today like you used to do a few decades ago. You're leaving way too many people behind. People won't accept that. That's why you see the disconnect. I often say trade is not a race to the bottom. It's a march to the top. When we say that we should talk about gender in trade agreement, when we say that we should be protecting the environment while we trade, when we say that we should protect workers while we trade, that makes sense. That resonates with people around the world. And I can assure you that ministers often say to Canada, please continue to be ambitious in these elements because it allows us domestically to raise the standard. No one in this room, no Canadians watching us would want us to be trading and say, well, we'll be doing more trade by reducing standards. People expect us in the 21st century in 2018 to make sure that you respect the environment, that you respect workers, that you talk about gender. I often say, you know, which game can you win with 50% of the team on the bench? That just makes sense. So I would say quite the opposite, and people were right. That's what distinguished Canada and the world. You, know, you were right to say that our trade agreement with Europe was the most progressive. It's the one which is the gold standard of the world. But I can tell you, for example, that what you see in that agreement now, a lot of countries, the European Union, are trying to replicate. Canada was the first G7 nation to have a gender chapter. I can tell you when I got the WTO, and they say, Minister, can we get that clause again? Because you know it just makes sense. 
you know, I think Europe is going to replicate that in its trade agreement, many nations. So, yes, you are at the forefront. Yes, uh, sometimes it may uh, sound difficult, but that's how you move the needle. That's how you make progress in the world. That's how you distinguish Canada. I can assure you, uh, when you look at NAFTA, for example, what's difficult, it's not the progressive stuff. It's the same stuff that Brian Mulroney was fighting at the time. It, dispute resolution, it's chapter 19, it's about procurement. Those are the tough issues that remain in trade agreements. But I would say, uh, and the people were right, the progressive element is what makes people want to invest in Canada. Millenniums are voting with their feet and their values. We sit in our numbers, we sit with the number of students, and, and I think Canadians have given us a broad social and political license to have a broad-based trade agenda, but they want us to trade with our values and our principle. Final question before we go to audience questions uh, via Slido, and that's about TPP. Yeah. What's going on? Can we salvage it? Yeah, I mean, listen, we made a lot of progress in Da Nang, uh, but there's still things to, to, to work out. I mean, I must say that uh, the way it was left uh, where we took it when we took government is that uh, the previous government compromised on too much. Uh, so we came to the table, I came to the table, and say, hold on for a minute. Uh, I think Canadians expect us to stand up for them, uh, whether it's the auto sector, whether it's culture, to make sure that uh, we just don't get any deal, but we get a good deal. Again, I'm saying these deals are there for decades to come, so uh, it is significant for us to get them right. And that's what I stood up for Canada uh, last time. And I think that's what gives confidence to Canadians when they say in us abroad. They know we're, we're having their back, they know we're at the forefront, but they want us to engage with confidence, uh, smartly, making sure that we open up market, but that we also care for our industries, for our workers, for the middle class. That's what I do when I stand abroad. I stand up for Canadians and making sure that at the same time, uh, we develop these markets uh, in, in Asia or in South America.